Uh, of this Theosophical Lodge and uh, really an author, scholar, and a dear friend. Step in. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The Besant Lodge of Hollywood Theosophical Society has the, the truly the pleasure and the honor to welcome one of our dear friends and my dear colleague of many years here at Lyons, who uh, now is uh, gracing the wild west of Arizona in terms of his residence, <laughs> but who comes here and who, this is his first uh, evening in what we hope is going to be a long series of, uh, of, of the fourth Thursday of every month when he will continue with this class. And many, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know something about him already, so I'm not going to reveal you with that. But you know he is, uh, he is a man of many, many varied experiences, uh, starting as a, as a very young man. He shouldn't even have been in the service at the time at the great uh, Battle of Anzio, and subsequently <laughs> in, in academia and uh, with, Joseph, with Joseph Campbell and with all the creative people in San Francisco. Uh, he's, he's truly one of our national and California treasures. Pierre Grimes, we are so happy that you are here with us, and we, we hope very much that you're going to have some very nice classes. We do all kinds of other things here, you know, at other times of the week, and the, our flyers and announcements are back there, so when you, <coughs> when you have your refreshments, so you, you, may, you may wish to take a look at them, and then maybe I'll see you at some of my activities as well. So God bless you all, and we are so happy you could come, and we, could, we are so happy that our dear friend could come, and we hope you have a very, very fine class. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to, I'll be back in about 10 minutes, but I also just want to say that this is a purely by donation thing. There's a, a beautiful handmade box back there. Please give generously, and all of it goes to Pierre. We want that to happen, so. Ah. The one thing that we want to know is the nature of the self. It's nice to know that everyone has one. It's curious that very few of us know what it is to know the self. The idea of the self was the most central notion in the classical world. Know thyself was the primary idea that motivated the entire classical world. The idea of the self is in all of the ancient literature, but you won't be able to find it. That's all. Now we have to explore what was just said. <laughs> Everybody in the classical world played with the idea of the one. The highest view, of, the highest vision of the one is the ultimate nature of reality and beyond that, the divine God, the Dia Negativa. The one about which you can say nothing. And so many works have been written about it because Parmenides started it all having had a brilliant teacher by the name of Xenophanes. And so Plato picked up Parmenides and did a dialogue called the Parmenides. Now, what is so interesting about that? This idea of the self This idea of the self 
is totally ignored in all of the translations of Plato's Parmenides, Plato's Republic, on and on. It is entirely ignored. It appears 600 times in Plato's Parmenides, but it's never translated. It is ignored completely. Hey, why is that? The idea of self in the Greek can also be translated as a rather curious word. It can be translated itself, thyself, oneself, him, her. It takes many forms. But all of the many forms that it may have, when it's separated from any article in front of it, it stands for just self. It occurs hundreds of times, but no one translates it. What difference does it make? Huh. It means, therefore, when people are studying Plato, they have to go around and ask themselves, what is the one? Oh, the one is very difficult to understand. There's a whole metaphysics about it. It's very perplexing, but it's not perplexing. It is not perplexing. There's no puzzle about it. If you're willing to just do one thing, go back and put in this one word. Why? When Plato's talking about the one, he doesn't call it the one. He calls it oneself. He doesn't call it the one. That's what modern translators, every translator in, in, that has translated Plato in English does the same thing. They ignore that, they ignore the self, they talk about the one. What does that mean? That means that all of the confusions that people have in trying to make sense of this dialogue which is central to philosophy is obscure, difficult to understand. But if you see that he's talking in the many different ways about the self, now what are the ways you can talk about the self? He said, I'll tell you what, the Parmenides. He said, of everything you say about the one, pure one, Well, if you really mean a pure one, then you can't say, it has no predicates. You can't say anything about it. Because if I were to say the one is, then I'm adding existence to the idea of the one, and it's no longer the one. I can't talk about it as a whole, because if it is a one, a whole has many parts, and it can't be a whole and so on. So therefore, there's a whole list of things called the negatives that can be assigned to the one. But then when Socrates finishes his talk in the Parmenides about the first hypothesis, he strings all of these negatives together and he then says you must attribute all of these negatives to the one Self, not just the one. What does that mean? It means the highest vision of the self is identical with the highest vision of God or ultimate reality. Now, in this game of philosophy and Parmenides and all of these class of thinkers, there's a fundamental difference between the nature of reality and God in the highest sense. In the highest sense, the pure God is the day of negativity, about which you can say nothing. But that means all the negatives you assign to the one, you must now attribute to the one self. However, 
You know what's interesting is that things that have a, a rose, a flower, has a perfume. Uh, people have a, an uh, impact upon others. Uh, they can sense others. They can be bewildered about others. That is to say, they're like a, you can say, they're very much like a candle. The light that emerges from the candle is not the flame. It's the way it exhibits its property of the flame. The nature of reality is a divine luminosity. A divine luminosity. Because it's the manifestation of the pure God or the one that, the one self. It's a manifestation of it. It's an actual power of it. That's what we call ultimate reality. Now, wait a minute. This you can know. This you can have opinions about. In this sense of the divine luminosity, people who experience it encounter not only divine luminosity, but a brilliance, a pure brilliance. And they get to say, that's mind itself, or that's me. Therefore, the idea of the self can be discovered in the experiences of divine luminosity. Well, how does this divine luminosity manifest itself? Uh, Plato goes along and does something quite remarkable. He says, you know what? The whole secret about our existence, he said you can really express it in a rather curious riddle. Consider this a film strip. Each one of these are particular scenes, microseconds apart. And there's always between them a blank. By the way, the eye operates the same way. It takes so many pictures per second. And there's a gap, therefore, between them. There's a gap. Uh, how does the self fit into this? Plato is saying, with the idea of the self, that things change. You know what? If you wanted to study something changing, right, you'd take a motion picture of it, and then you'd watch each frame, but you'd never see motion in any of the frames. They're all static. Well, then get a high-speed camera. Same problem. There's this gap. You never capture motion. Motion is an illusion. Motion, you assume, exists because of the changes you see in the microseconds of each second. Wait a minute. Then what accounts for change? There must be something new that comes in. There must be something that is exited, leaves, right, out, in. But it's a very peculiar kind of change. What is left out 
must fit exactly what is. The new must fit exactly what appears in the next scene. What does that? Let us say, you know what? All change is really taking place in the gap. That's the very basis of all order. All order exists in between the gaps in time. That order has such a magnificent order, you have to elevate the idea of order and call it the Logos. The Logos is super rational. If that's the case, this Logos, which is present here, which determines each new thing and what's allowed to, ex to become out or exited, that's what he calls the self Logos. It's a manifestation of the self as a pure, rational, super rational system which is nothing other than the rational understanding, the grasp of the self understood as a rational system capable of determining each change in our existence. Therefore, what's there is the self-logos. Wait a minute. He says, look here. This is very clear. Dear Negativa, it's a pure one self. This is the divine luminosity. This is the third. You say, you know what? There's something more important that we cannot forget. That there is also inherent in the idea of the Logos not only that which is, governing that which is, but that which is not. What does that mean? He says, you know what? You have to see that if this idea of the self truly exists, then there is a way in which the self manifests itself and that which is not. Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> he says, well, yeah, I'll tell you what that means. He says, uh, inherent in the self, inherent in the self, it allows a vast variety because we already have three levels of self. He says, there's a fourth level of the self. And that is the self allows itself the possibility of fictions, things that are not true, in principle, not real. Hey. All false ideas of oneself are really the causes of all the difficulties we have in life. If in somehow we gain a false image of ourselves, that becomes a predominant idea which we don't even suspect is there, but nonetheless it plays havoc in our lives because much of our concerns in our working world play themselves out from that premise inherent in that false image of the self, however you gained it. So therefore, the self, the false images of the self belong to the self. <laughs> Why do we say that? Look here. If you have a false belief of the self, 
then you feel bad about yourself. You feel miserable about yourself. All the negative feelings that occur in anybody's life give evidence, give evidence to the fact that you have a self. Why? Because you don't like the miserable state you get into as a consequence of having a false idea of the self. Therefore, intimately connected. False images of the self presuppose a self. Presupposes a self because you don't like it. You know what? If the world was really designed without a self, then people who had false images of the self, they would just be another thing. So they have a false image of themselves. So what? But you don't like that. You have an interest in being a better self, of having a better self and encountering a better self. You want to get out of this realm. Oh. If you want to get out of this self, pardon me, if you want to get out of the false image of the self that presupposes you have a self that is keenly aware of the fact that there are false images of the self that you may have that are ruining your life. Well, wait a while. Here's another thing about the self. What if the universe now can be can be seen in yet another way. There's one last view of the self. Suppose the self we all have it, but we can't know it. Then this is a fundamental dualism an impossible dualism, a hostility between the two. If you have a self and you don't know it, then you're, you're living a life in which there is nothing but chaos. And that happens, of course. So these five different views of the self, its presence, its fictional, its fundamental ordering of all principles, the self as a luminous reality, the highest vision, which is in Buddhism, you see, this is the dia negativa. This is the Buddhism which claims the highest state is emptiness. Plato was saying the same thing, with one difference. That emptiness, you still have a self. <laughs> if, you're, if you're totally enlightened, you know what? You're there. You have the enlightenment. You don't may have. You may not have a false image of the self, but you're still there. Otherwise, the moment you have a great enlightenment experience, you'd be gone. But the self remains. The self remains, knowing that there are negatives. Therefore, you'll never stumble over a false image of the self. You're blissfully pleasant about things. You allow things to be as they are. But you know that there must be a self that has the emptiness, or is the emptiness, or can live through the emptiness. So now look here. If this idea of the self It's connected with the logos. Ah. That means that's a fundamental rationality dealing with the human psyche. Now, what does that mean? That means something extraordinary. That means in every Seen in every daydream, in every dream, you are receiving messages, you are receiving messages of profound significance 
that take the form of your present scenes, your everyday day daydreams as well as dreams, if that's true, then there's a way of rationally understanding dreams without interpreting anything and daydreams. That's right. Wait a minute. How can you know yourself? How can you come to know yourself in every scene? What does it take? Well, one thing is obvious. The self is in every scene. But how can you, how can you contact it? How can you make it viable and livable to yourself? Parmenides' teacher was Xenophanes, and he had a grasp of it. He said, look here, there's only one thing I need to know. It's the whole that sees, hears, and thinks. thinks. People in the classical world offered explanations of what the whole was. Some said, it's the mind. It's the mind that sees, hears, and thinks. Pardon me, thinks. <laughs> Parmenides says, wait a minute. It's the self that sees. So right, look here, right now. You're listening to me. What is it that's hearing my voice? If you can hold on to that question, if you can hold on to that question, that's all you need. That's your meditation. You don't need anything else. If you're thinking along with me, What's doing the thinking? Hey, you can answer this in two ways. Theoretically, you can say, well, it's the self. Or you can say, wait a minute, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to know what it's like to be in the presence of the self. If I can have a false idea of the self, I can get to understand that. How can I get to understand the self? Just the self. Back here. This is the fundamental question of all classical thought. This is their meditation. It can be yours. What difference does it make to take this and use it in every event? Right now, what is it that's seeing and hearing and thinking? But what is it if you pause and you try to let whatever that is emerge? What would you have? Does it allow increase in depth? Does that question then open up higher states of mind? Does its presence acknowledge itself? Now look here, what does that mean? It means in some way you want the mind to churn about itself. And to be able to encounter the subject. Oh. Does the mind have that ability? Hmm. Now, in Greek thought, there's one absolutely great word that is not translated, that should be translated. And Anglicize it, usia. Usia is the Greek word for that 
ability of the mind to turn upon itself and see itself. When translators get this word, they often use the word substance, essence, or essence, or being essence. None of these words capture this. Look here. If you have a mind, and if you want to know the self, there has to be something in the mind itself that's capable of turning about and countering itself. That, in the Greek world, is the, is the property of usia. So therefore, you can awaken your mind to see itself by pushing this one question and making that your primary concern. Now, it either is going to make a difference to you in a matter of a short period of a couple of weeks. Do it. See what comes up. You know what will happen? You will find something rather curious. You'll then look at the world, experience the world, as if it is an object that you are standing apart from, but yet you are not different from it. Woo, wait a minute, that's very difficult. That's beginning to start with this curious point that these events that emerge, which I charge sheet on, let's do it. Here's the question. Here we are. What if all that is is the manifestation of the self? <laughs> well, but um, is it possible that our self is the same as the self? What is the relation between my self and the self? Well, uh, wait a minute, this is one, this is many. There are many people, each one has their own self. This is plural. How can the, how can the manyness being a plural in any way be able to assert itself as being fundamentally nothing but all that is? You don't have to ask that. You don't have to ask that question if you realize you can answer it by direct experience. That's all. You see, we believe that ourselves, each one of us, has a separate individual self. By the way, is that true? If you try this game, would you see yourself as a unique self, different from everyone else? Ah, look here, again. There are many selves. Everything can be called a self. I can talk about this as itself. This is what it is. Itself is just a microphone. Chair itself. I can talk about everything as it itself, can I? Does that mean everything has a self? That's absurd. Wait a minute, no it isn't. But now let's shift gears. We're familiar with false idea of the self.
suppose for the moment we can say the reason we can't appreciate the self is that we have been introduced and been, we have learned that we, that we are not anything noble and, and genuinely spiritual. Uh, we're really this and that and the other things, some low thing. Well then, where did we get every single self-image, false self-image? We learned it. If we learned it, we can unlearn it. Therefore, is it possible <clears throat> that we have a classic example of a Greek, classical Greek hero that really uncovered a false image of himself and then discovered the nature of himself? <clears throat> And that all the Greeks knew this figure? Yes. This is the story of Homer's Iliad, Achilles. He was considered, before he woke up and got rid of his false image of the self, as the worst possible Greek in Greek history. The worst possible human being. What he was doing and what he planned on doing and the story called the Iliad is terrible. Uh, this general, he was in, a commander of his own troops. The general stole his wife, captured her. He was so mad at him. He said, look here, I'm going to pull my troops, pull them away from the war. We're going to sit and watch the war go on and I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to enjoy their defeat. Better than that, I have a way of getting back my wife. I'll get all kinds of treasures from the general. I know what to do. I'll tell him I'm going into battle if he gives me back my wife and all the treasures that he should then compensate me for the loss of my wife. Yeah, and uh, I'll go into battle for that, and the next morning I'll go back on the ships and load them with all the loot I've gathered, and sail away, leaving the troops to the next day to fight the war without me. He didn't fight. He sent in his best friend in his armor, Patroclus, and Patroclus died in the battle, and he said, oh my God. What am I doing? Where did I get this idea? Where did I get... How did I become the worst person? Now he goes through a process of reflection. Hey, Usia, on a high level. He tells us how he learned this idea of himself, that he was above and a friend of God, and God, Zeus, would never have anything except good for him and guide him and guide him and protect him in battle. is where I get the junk. So he goes through an analysis, beautiful analysis. Every step along the way, who his teacher was, it turns out to be Lord Phoenix, which happens to have been uh, the man who raised him. His mother was a goddess. He said, oh, I got all that from him. So he tells us in a beautiful example all of the steps he went through to unpack this false image of the self. What does he do then? Then, he then can go, get ready to go into battle. Not only does he go into battle, but he has a divine illumination, right? He has the experience of the presence of the good or the presence of the self manifesting itself in pure radiance. And so therefore he becomes from the worst person in history, Greek history, to the paramount god, pardon me, idol of the Greek people, because he got rid of the false image of the self. All Greek tragedies deal with the same thing. Right? All the Greeks went to the tragedies. Why? They wanted to see how behavior affects them 
how these false images of themselves played themselves out in every family. So therefore they were involved in this entire exploration of the self. That was their primary goal. What happened to it? What happened to it? Well, dark ages came, right? We know what happened during the dark ages. Learning ceased, everything ceased, and slowly we, we built up once again. But we followed the Roman model, not the Greek model. Our education is Roman, not Greek. What does that mean? That means we decided to build a republic on the model of Rome, not democracy on the model of the Greeks. What does that mean? It means then that when our scholars then went to the classic world to translate all of their literature, and they did a remarkable job, they only left out one thing, the idea of the soul. Everywhere they saw it, they said, no, put in itself. It's a betrayal. There's a virtual betrayal of common sense, of reason, of pure reflection and European scholarship because of this fact that they refuse to translate where it is most perfectly and clearly, they ignore it. They put in place itself. Now look here. If it is true then that we can now return to the idea of the self based upon that one idea of Xenophanes, which Parmenides picked up as a kinship with the one called the one self, and then you can see all of the possible ways in which it can be reasoned on those five levels. Now you're using your mind and you're now seeing how the self can be understood on five levels, which are the primary levels of the self. Now you're living in a different way and you can greet one another in a different way. You're not seeing different people differently. They all have the same noble sense of self. You can address themselves as the self. You're seeing nothing other than the self. Every person is divine because their divinity rests upon the self. It is not an abstraction. It's something you can perceive and learn yourself in a very short while if you cut the nonsense and hold on to that. Second step, you want to know how to see the false image of the self. One way. All set? There it goes. One idea you need to know first. All false images of the self are incompatible, are incompatible with the pure notion of the self. Let me put that this way. If you now have a goal and you want to achieve a goal, as long as it has steps that require discipline and dedication, the more noble the goal, the more you will see this is true. As you set out to achieve that, it presupposes, of course, that you've done some homework. But as you go up these steps, you will be blocked because the false idea of the self is incompatible with the idea of the self you would have if you did achieve your noblest goal. Therefore, you'll face failure on two levels. You'll either face failure and quit, or you'll depreciate the goal 
and say, oh, it's nothing but depreciate it so you really can't absorb it and live it. And therefore, there's only one way out of this trouble, easy to do. You ask yourself, what is it that's the most noble thing I can do? What is it my dream? What are the dreams I've had as a youth that I've given up? What are the works I really want to master that I haven't? Uh, what is a personal challenge that most insignificant to me? Make that your goal. Ah, see? The more pure the goal, the more you'll see the false image of the self emerge that will block you from achieving it. That's what you want. Because once it surfaces, now you can look for its source and its roots. When that happens then, you are now turning upon yourself reflectively. Right? That presupposes a method for uncovering how you learned this false image. That's what you want to know. What were the circumstances? Why did you turn, why were you so stupid as to believe a false image of yourself? What possibly could have taken place that allows you to believe that you are less than yourself? That's the mystery, see? That's what you have to answer. In every case, it's the same answer. You'll have to see it. We'll go over it later, right? But this is the key. You're not going to get out of that false belief of the self unless you discover what were the circumstances that brought you to believe it. What happened in your youth? Has to happen in your youth. want to protect their children. Everyone wants to protect their children. It's all over. It happens all over. But we're as particularly suspicious of one thing. When we see our children, usually five, six, seven, those years, if we see them doing something with an openness, they're receptive, right? they're open, they're having, as it were, fun, they're fully engaged. And whatever they're doing, it doesn't matter what they're doing. the parents will recognize that state as possibly being dangerous to the child to remain in and to be free and to allow that to continue unabated. They know that there's certain people in the world will take advantage of them if they see them in that state. They want to protect their child. So what do they do? At that moment, they come in and they are going to say, you should never do this. They'll blame the thing the kid is involved in, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. But they really don't want this state to be accompanying that state as a present state with them. They don't want the child to encourage any free development of that. They don't want this to go on and mature. So they have to block it. Um, when I got involved in this work years ago, back in the 60s, I was working with this 
PhD chemist. He was an alcoholic, periodic alcoholic. And we had a lot of fun together because uh, he liked talking to me because I said, look, I don't have any theories about uh, how, why you're drinking or anything else. I just have just one curiosity. I'd like to chart your last drunk. He was a periodic alcoholic. Well, every time he, I was running a, a rehabilitation center as a psychologist, that was the, before they allowed the term to become legal. Uh, I was in San Francisco at the time, San Francisco Public Welfare. And so we had a big blackboard, and I'd say, hey, hi, come on, get your back, your back. Oh, last drunk? Yeah, oh yeah. And we would draw out all the things he did, and he had some really great stories. One of them was, if you want to go on a drunk, you don't want to get picked up by a cop, always take a copy, get a copy of Wall Street Journal, put it under your arm, and you can go around somewhat drunk, and they'll let you go. He said, that's the key. They know you're just a, they'll, they'll, they'll let you go. So we went over this again and again. So I finally did some on a paper board, and then we put those on the board, and said, oh, you're back, and another one, you know. Well, one day, the guy stops, and he says, hey, you know what? I don't know whether this matters or not, but, uh, he said, you know, do you mind if I talk about my early years? I said, go ahead. He said, well, I'm about seven or so, and, and uh, eight, I think. He said, I used to play football. All the kids played football. We didn't have any uniforms. We didn't have any pads in those days. He said, you know, the kids go out there and play football in the good old hard soil. He said, my mother, every time I left, she'd sit by the, stand by the doorway and she'd say, now, son, uh, do your best, but remember, uh, either come home with your shield or on it. I said, what do you find interesting in that? He said, well, every drunk, every last, my final drunk, when I'm finally pulled in, I'm coming back into the hospital with a stretcher. <laughs> he said, you know what? He said, I think I'm acting out. My mother's, you know, my mother's, uh, we're Spartans. We're all Greeks. I said, well, well, what was it about that was so, why, why, why did that make such an impact upon you? So he thought for a while and he said, you know what? At those times, my mother, she was very busy with doing everything. This is when she took time out. She directed all her attention at me. I was now her object of devotion. She looked beautiful. Everything she said sparkled. She was at her best. Hey, she was at her best. She was communicating. She was getting through to him. She was showing care. Hey, he said, you know what? Care. Knowing. Knowing the risk I was taking. Right? I was getting recognition. I never got any other way else. Wait a minute. That was an appearance. That was an appearance of caring, knowing, and loving. But it was the highest vision he had of her. And therefore, he accepted it. And what did he do? He lived it out until this event, and then he said, what the hell am I doing this for? I said, you know, you're not going to be free, I think, unless you put a name on what she's doing. Of course, she, loves, she looks like she's loving and caring and knowing and getting great recognition, but what do you want to call that? He said, well, that's love. I said, you want to call that love? He said, well, no, no, I guess it isn't really love. Well, I said, unless you put a name on what she's doing, you're still going to be caught. He said, well, she sacrificed so much for me, I can't really say anything negative about her. I said, okay, you're going to keep your problem, I guess. 
So I said, yeah, that's giving me a lot to uh, wonder about. Uh, I think I'll leave. I said, okay, you can leave. Never saw him again. I don't know whether he was able to put a name on her, but what was she doing? What name would you call she? What is it that she's doing? Sure. Sure, she's worried. What else? Manipulating. And how? What kind of a name do you put on a person who manipulates in this way? Control. More? Controller. Controller. Good. More? Come on. Con. Con. Conning. Ooh. More. He's being a good object, so the bad object he internalized the things he did my friend as well. That was anger directed in when he's alcohol. So he had to think of his mother as all good. So it was something she was doing that uh, he felt he needed her approval to think of her as all good. Yeah. See, Achilles had to do the same thing. He finally had to say what was my mother doing? What was my mother doing? What did my surrogate parent do in my early years? And he says, hey, you know what? I do recall some of the things my Lord Phoenix, his surrogate. He said, you know, uh, I raised Achilles. He's talking about Achilles. He says, I raised Achilles so he would one day take care of me when I grow old. I have no children. He will become my child who will take care of me. What does that mean? <coughs> what do you want to call that? Let me try it again. Are they being truthful? Is this true? Is she being true? Is true to herself? Then she's lying. Oh, then she's setting up a pretense. Now we have to put a name on her. Self-serving. Self-serving. More. Yes, that's that's the tribe. Isn't she giving a, a, a model for? Achieving excellence that really isn't a, isn't doesn't allow for growth and and it's like a setup for for death or failure. Yeah. Right. Yes. It was a setup for final death. Yeah. So it was a killing message. Yeah. A killing pattern. It yes. It's like caring, but actually it will lead just into his dying. His ah. Dying on his shield. He was conditional love as well. That's good. Hey, you know what you're getting close to saying? <laughs> Presenting a false image of the self in order to influence someone who has not yet developed the rational function to be able to question things, which is what you need to be when you're six, seven, eight of those years. Well, look here. If this is true, that this can lead that young man to repeated failures again and again and again, then this image is the cause of all Vice. A false image of the self is productive of all the vice that you'll ever experience, and so will anyone else. That's, that's a terrible thing. What does that mean? You can't produce a false image of yourself without bringing about chaos. You can't do it no matter how, how noble your intentions are because you're betraying the self. The self cannot be called a bad name. You can't function with a bad name. 
without paying the price for it. And therefore, the real goal is what is the self? How can you best understand it? And that's now the door you can go into. Because now if you get into Plato, you can now read it. If you get a good translation, get the one that has the self in it. And there's only one, by the way, that meets that condition. Balboa's... Right. Juan and Marie Balboa, their translations, which are available now. Uh, what? Of Balboa. B A L B O A. Yes, do it again. B A L B O A. Maybe everybody knows that pretty common name. But you only have Balboa. Thank you. You may need an A. An A. Watch. <laughs> I can even put it where it belongs. A. Thank you. Thank you. I need that. Hey, all of his translations are easy to get. They're on the web, right? You can download them, or you can get hard copies of them, and then you can play the game on the most sophisticated level. You want to play that way? Come back next time. We'll have fun together. That's where we're going. All right. Now, <laughs> as you leave, I did two articles. One is called The Betrayal, and it was published by a journal. There are copies of it back there. You can get a copy of it. And there's also The Philosophy of the Self, which is the second article that was published in the same journal, the following. The first, there are copies there. They're open. They're free. Please take them. Take a look at where we're going, because that's where we're going the next time we meet together. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Time for coffee and talk. <laughs>